Well, I get this question that what is Bitcoin? Bitcoin is a digital currency that you can use to sell or buy pretty much everything on planet, from grocery to clothes and cards. Technically speaking, Bitcoin is a cryptocurrency based on a decentralized trustless verification system. Oh my god, what does this even mean? To understand it, let's review the existing payment structure. In the traditional settings, we need governments to issue currency like dollars or euros and we need banks or other financial institutions to manage and verify transactions between users. So imagine, if I want to send money to Mitch, the transaction should go through a third-party authority like a bank. The bank acts like a middleman and record this transaction in its private ledger, which no one from outside has access to. So the system is not transparent to the public. The bank also keeps the ledger at a central and hopefully safe location. So this system is centralized and it works based on the trust that Mitch and I have in the system. So what's the problem here? In this scenario, we are handing absolute power to the government and banks to control and manage money. And we all know what it comes with the absolute power, so I'm not going to talk about it. So here's the mission for Bitcoin and all other cryptocurrencies. We want to create a public ledger that is transparent so everyone can see all the transactions and it's decentralized, which means everyone has a copy of the most recent ledger. So instead of giving the absolute power to banks or governments to manage money, we want to have a system that the power is distributed between all players and is transparent to everyone, which means all players can access to the public ledger and finally, no one trusts no one. Now we can see why Bitcoin was a revolution in the payment history as it was different in every single aspect. The traditional payment system was not transparent to the public. It was centralized and it works based on the trust that we have in the system. In Bitcoin, the system is transparent, decentralized, and trustless. As we learned, Bitcoin is cryptocurrency based on the decentralized trustless verification system. But how is it possible? If no one trusts no one, how does the system work at the first place? How do we make sure no one mess with the system, for example adding a fake line to the ledger saying Iman paid Mitch 200 bucks or even overspend money? To achieve a system that is trustless and fraud proof, we need cryptography. So the Bitcoin philosophy is basically nothing more than a public ledger minus trust plus cryptography. That's why Bitcoin is called cryptocurrency. To understand the underlying principles, First, we need to learn about digital signature. Digital signature has two main components. Public key, which is like your email address that you share with other people, and private key or secret key, which is like your password. To send money to someone, you just need their public address. A simple analogy for this is you just need someone's email address to send a message to them. But to initiate the transaction, you need to use your private key to sign it. This is similar to the case if you want to send an email from your account to someone, first you need to log into your account using your password. In other words, you need to get verified using your password or your secret key. Now let's fully digest how the Bitcoin works. The smallest unit of Bitcoin system is one transaction. Imagine I want to send two Bitcoins to Mitch. Bitcoin is exactly like any valid currency like dollars. This is the simple message, Iman pays two bitcoins to Mitch. The problem with this message is it's too transparent to the public. We don't want that. To protect the identities, we replace names with encrypted strings. How we encrypted this is beyond the scope of this video, but to let you know these values are derived from your public key and are unique to you. It's very difficult 
to link these strings to the actual person, but if you are in law enforcement or very well informed, it's not impossible. For this reason, Bitcoin transactions are considered pseudo-anonymous, not fully anonymous. The next step to have a valid transaction is to sign it by the sender. The math behind it is a bit complicated and rely on an algorithm called SHA-256. Here is a simple explanation. To sign a transaction, the sender combines the message with the private key and then pass it through the algorithm SHA-256. The output is a signature with a fixed length, 256 bits to be exact. The thing that makes this algorithm super cool is the fact that it's not reversible function. What does it mean? Let's say we have this function y equal to 2x. If I tell you x is 3, you know y must be 6. Or if I tell you y is 6, you know x must have been 3. So this operation is reversible. If you have x, you can find y, or the other way around. But SHA-256 is not reversible, i.e. if you know the signature and message, you cannot find the private key. You can of course guess it, but the chance of finding the correct private key is 1 over 2 to the power of 256. This is stupidly a large number. To put it in a perspective, 2 power 32 is roughly 4 billions guess. So 2 to the power of 256 is this multiplied by itself by 8 times. So this translates to roughly 65,000 billion guesses. So good luck finding it. You might say, okay Iman, I get it. It's impossible to find the private key from the signature. But why the hell I need your private key? All I need is your signature to forge it. And you say, if the digital signature is basically a bunch of zeros and ones, what prevents me to copy and paste it wherever I want? You're smart, but you wish that were true. Please note the output depends on both the message and the private key. Unlike the handwritten signature that looks exactly the same on all documents, the digital signature will change as the message changes. To understand this, let me run a simple example. Let's say this is our message. I combine that with my private key and here is what I got if I apply the magic SHA-256 function. Now, if I change the message slightly just by adding a dot at the end with the same private key, I'm gonna get something that is completely different. That's the beauty of digital signature that we use to sign our transaction. So far, we learned the smallest element of Bitcoin system is one transaction. To protect the identities, public keys are used to replace names with encrypted strings which are unique to individuals, like our fingerprints. The sender passes the message and his private key into the SHA-256 algorithm to generate the signature. Now, as promised, we want to have a transparent payment system. So I need to broadcast this transaction to the world so everyone is up to date. The question is, how listeners verify if this is a legit transaction? Here's how that happens. The receivers get the message that includes a signature and they already have access to my public key. After all, it's public. They mash them up and run it against another algorithm which generates true or false. That means valid or invalid. Also, the protocol checks my previous transactions history to confirm that I have enough bitcoins to initiate the transaction. To put it simply, if you want to buy a car that costs 10k, the seller needs to make sure you already earned at least 10k. It's somehow similar to a credit check. Now let's say the transaction is valid and verified by all the players. How do we record it in our public ledger so the transaction is not getting lost? It's like when you play a video game, you need to save your progress, otherwise it will be lost. This brings us to another concept called blockchain. Instead of having a full ledger, 
we divide it into blocks. Each block lists around 2,400 valid transactions. And these blocks are chained to each other with timestamps. So blockchain is nothing more than a chain of blocks one after another. Basically, this is the history of all transactions so far and everyone in the network has a copy of the recent version. That's why Bitcoin is called decentralized. The question is, how my valid transaction gets included in a blockchain? Here is what would happen. All the new transactions go to a new block that is not still chained. To chain the block, first we need to have something called proof of work. And guess what? We need some folks called miners to get that proof for us. Let's see what does this mean. The miner gets the new block, which includes recent valid transactions, plus the ID of the previous validated block. The only and only job for the miner is to find, or better to say, guess a number that when added to the block information and applied the magic function SHA-256, it generates an output, usually referred to as hash, with a fixed length that starts with certain number of zeros. For example, let's say 20 zeros. The rest doesn't matter. The magic number is basically the proof of work and is referred to as nonce or number used once. So the whole Bitcoin mining is all about who can guess the magic number first. As soon as the lucky winner finds the magic number, he adds it to the block and broadcasts the victory to the network. Finally, everyone adds the valid block to the end of the chain and this block is set. All the other miners immediately stop working on that block and start trying to figure out the magic number for the next block which includes the new transactions. You might say why not faking the hash by generating a number that starts with 20 zeros and the rest is bunch of random numbers and then doing the reverse to find the magic guess. You wish. As I mentioned before, SHA-256 is not reversible and the only and only way to find this number is to go this way and keep guessing. To guess fast, or technically, to check a lot of numbers per second, you need lots of computation power, which is expensive and energy consuming. That's why the Bitcoin mining is really hot in the countries where the electricity is cheap. Over time, as the computational power goes up and more miners join the guessing game, the Bitcoin algorithm increases the number of zeros at the beginning of the hash to make it more difficult to guess. To give you a rough estimate, the chance to generate a hash that starts with 24 zeros is roughly equal to the chance of winning a lottery jackpot when you select 6 numbers out of 49. Now, if the number of zeros goes up to 30, the chance is 72 times less than winning a lottery. The other question is, what is in this game for the miners? Well, when they find the lucky number, they add a special transaction to the block to claim their reward. The reward to find the magic number was 50 bitcoins when the bitcoin was invented in 2009. Every 4 years, the rewards get cut by half. Now it's 6.25 bitcoins. Besides the reward, for each transaction included in the block, the miners also collect a small transaction fee, which is like a tip from the sender who is pseudonymous to the miner. This tip incentivizes the miners to include my transactions in the recent block. It's like if you are a waiter in a restaurant and you know from the past that, that this lady is very generous and she's gonna tip you a lot, most likely you provide a better and faster service for her. The second question is why the hell do we need this useless stupid number at the first place? Well, if the number doesn't exist, everyone could log bunch of fraudulent transactions together in a block and send 1000 blocks to a network in a fraction of a second. This makes the chain so messed up that would become impossible to untangle and the whole system becomes unreliable and worthless. The exhaustive computation enforced by the Bitcoin protocol makes it very time consuming to find the magic number. For this reason, 
it takes roughly about 10 minutes to create a new block and add it to the chain. This gives enough time to the network to validate and digest the new block. It's very interesting to note this cryptography ensures that each block of transactions is bolted onto the last block in a long, transparent and immutable chain. Imagine a thief wants to change one of these transactions even slightly. For example, changing 2 to 20 bitcoins. In this case, as the content of the block is changed, the hash of this block generated by SHA-256 is changed as well and not valid anymore. So the hacker needs to guess the magic number again from a square one. And even worse, as all the blocks are chained and each block has the ID of the previous one, if you change anything here, you need to redo the whole work to find a special number for the altered block and the blocks after that. In this scenario, any fraud requires infeasible amount of computations, which is sometimes referred to as 51% attack, i.e. you need to control 51% of the computation of the whole planet and you must be extremely lucky to do it. Finally, let me explain why there are just 21 million bitcoins to mine. Because of the block reward that miners claim, the total amount of bitcoins in our economy increases with each new block. Roughly, every 10 minutes we get a new block. Approximately, there are 52,000 10 minutes chunks in a year. Every 4 years, the reward gets cut by half. This results to 21 million bitcoins. This limitation makes bitcoin more attractive as an asset. In theory, if the demand grows and the supply remains the same, the value will increase. Thank you very much for watching this video and I hope you find it useful. This video is created by Castafly, a software platform that empowers educators to easily create content without any audio or video editing background. As Castafly is an early stage startup with limited marketing budget, we heavily rely on your generosity to spread the word about our platform. If you enjoy this video, please share and like it with your network. And if you're a teacher, check out our website to generate content and share your wisdom with everyone out there who is hungry to learn. Thanks again and see you soon.